Say it would be the language of God. It's one thing to give a revelation. It's another thing to say it in a way where it's proud. And I want to make sure that I don't say it out of pride so you get in trouble. Do you know that if you operate out of pride, you'd be looking at somebody and say, oh, look at that sinner over there uh, in sexual sin. And then you stand there in pride? Do you know that's the same as that? You say, how do you know? Because I've done it. <laughs> I stood there in pride and judged somebody that was in another kind of sin. And you know what happens whenever you, whenever you operate in one of the big three? What are the big three? Lust of the eyes. I got to have what I see. Could be chocolate cake. <laughs> right? Lust of the flesh, which is sexual. Say it with me, sexual sin. <laughs> and number three is pride of life. Ain't that a... You know what? Whenever you have pride of life, you know what happens? Is that you find yourself judging other people and you know what happens? You grieve the Holy Ghost. You grieve the Holy Spirit. When you grieve the Holy Spirit, then your nerve endings go dead. And that's why religion, people that live in religion, they don't, they don't when, you, when I say miracles or when I say the power of God, well, they turn, they turn, they, they don't want to end that conversation. They, they have no, they're in, that's uncharted waters for them. Anything faith is uncharted waters for somebody that's become desynthesized by dead religion. Are you following this? Because many of us have gone through that. That's why I'm saying it. So let, let our, let, 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 our, let it be a relationship and not a religion, right? Let it be this. I have a miraculous relationship with Jesus Christ. You know what happens? I, I, I manifest power. And if I cannot, then I'm going to go back and say, Jesus, touch me. Because I want a visitation that will precede a habitation. I want the Holy Spirit to live in me. You see this right here, this uh, dove with the little house? <laughs> that's, that's so important to me. Because one of the major revelations, what to me, was that God would take a messed up addict and he would peel him off the road like dried up dog poop and he would fill him with the Holy Ghost of God and that he would make me in a temple where he would live. And I don't care about your messed up, sad excuse for tradition and religion. I careth not. <laughs> because all I want to do is have a relationship where the Spirit of God fills me and leads me and deals with me. <laughs> right? And so to me, one of the most powerful things that I can ever do is pray for somebody to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord lets me do it. You know, we pray for taxi drivers and people in hotels and all kind of crazy stuff. But you know what I'm saying? So to me, it's so important that we have a literal encounter, that we have a literal visitation. You see, you, see the Holy Spirit will only inhabit you to the degree of your visitation. The Holy Spirit can only inhabit you to the degree that he has visited you <sighs> i told you one time anyways i don't want to get into encounters right now but i'm going to say it like this god is very real <laughs> he's very real and he's very powerful and when the and when you have a visitation of the holy god you will <laughs> You will know it. <laughs> you, you might shake. You might be electrocuted. I, I'm just telling you. There are supernatural results. You will have a visitation. People say, well, I may not have to have a visitation like that. Well, maybe you don't want one. And the fact that you don't want to have a greater visitation tells me that you don't. See what I'm saying? <laughs> see, you've got to want more. God doesn't throw pearls to swine. Religion makes us into swine, but God makes swine into kings as we pursue His glory. <laughs> right? But the problem is we don't think we're swine. We're like, oh, my stuff don't stink. And your neighbor's like, oh, yeah, it does stink. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> your little snide remarks, you know, the way you tear people down so, so uh, creatively, you know. But how many want to really, really want to be disciples of Jesus? Come on. How many really want to be possessed by the spirit of holiness. How many really want to be led by and be befriended by the almighty God? I mean, before whom everything and every obstacle will melt like wax. I mean, how many want to really know this God? And I mean, how many really want a visitation that precedes a habitation? How many want this God to come and visit you and shake you up and inhabit you and live inside of you and upon you and speak to you? Huh, that's all I want. In fact, we started the church not because I wanted to start a church. I didn't even start this church because I wanted to start a church. I've never done a healing crusade in Africa or South America because I wanted to see miracles. 
but because I figured this, and you may or may not believe me, I figured this, I, power is for purpose. So I'm going to connect my life with a purpose that necessitates a visitation like that. <laughs> I don't know if anybody caught that. You see, Jesus was resurrected by the glory of the Father, but what was his purpose? To save, to save the lost. You see, some people won't even do what it takes to save themselves, but other people will do what it takes to save themselves and their family. But then there are some people that will draw a much bigger circle and they will call many, many people into that circle. How about you? <laughs> How much power do you need? <laughs> see, let us not be satisfied with having babies and having a shiny piece of metal sitting in our driveway. Come on! When Jesus died and was beaten to give you salvation in a kingdom that would rock this planet. I mean, how many want more? I mean, come on, man. People were, come on, people, I'm telling you, man. People, God will bless people and they start worshiping the things and the people that He blessed them with. Come on! How many say, you know, I'm going to shake that off and I'm going to do right by my family and I'm going to do right by my job, but I'm also going to be do right by the living King and the living God and I'm going to spend time with Him and get closer to Him and learn this thing called faith. The language of God. The language of God is the language of faith. The language of God. What, you, what do you mean the language of God? Did you know that your salvation is based on your communication with God? <laughs> your salvation is based on your communication with God. The language of God is the language of faith. Number one. How do you know? How do you know? Watch this. How do you know if you live by faith? Now let me ask you this question. Whenever you read the Bible, are you reading the Bible by faith? Let me ask you this. When you're sitting in a service like this, how do you know if you're sitting there in faith? <laughs> Did you know that you might sit there and be in faith when I say one thing, and when I say another thing, you're not in faith? We're all like that. We fluctuate. Or not. I mean, how many has ever noticed that? You, you're, one, one day you come to church, you're like, Woo, ba -ba -ba, you know? and then the next day you come to church, and you're just like, <laughs> come out <laughs> no <laughs> so you know your your faith it fluctuates doesn't it see so how can you so whenever you're reading the bible do you know how you read by faith do you know that sometimes you're reading the bible by faith and sometimes you're not reading by faith did you know that sometimes you're in prayer in faith and sometimes you're in prayer not in faith you're just waiting for your time to pass <laughs> right <laughs> So how do you know? Because, see, when you're reading the Bible and you're reading by faith, you know what happens? Your heart begins to burn for the Scripture and you begin to write. You say, well, my heart burns, but I don't write anything. Well, you just, you just learned something new. <laughs> how would you let your heart burn and not record what God said? <laughs> so how do you know when you're listening in faith? I'll tell you how you know. Because when you're listening in faith, your heart begins to burn when those words come into contact with your heart. Or you're listening with your head, trying to figure out how you don't have to obey what's being said. <laughs> you see, doubt is the platform for confusion and condemnation. Faith is the platform for repentance and transformation. You're condemning me, Will. You're doubting then. <laughs> All right? Okay, pulling out. Think about that one. Here we go. So... You know what? God's Word is a fire. You ready for this? God's Word is a fire. Now, a lot of people know me around here, and they say, the fire, yeah, he's, you know, Kyle, he loved the fire. Yeah, he's one of those fiery people. Well, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to deal with you right now. <laughs> Do you think that some of God's Word is a fire and some of His Word is not a fire? I present to you that sometimes you're listening by faith and it's a fire to you and sometimes you're not and it's only information. <laughs> you ready? Case in point. We'll find the most boring scripture in the Bible. Leviticus. <laughs> a big nasty uh, uh, wound on your leg and there's pus coming out and red hairs. <laughs> Ooh, that's boring. Why is that in the Bible? <laughs> Well, you know, that's boring. You know, you're telling me that that word's a fire? Oh, yes, it was. Because you see, when Moses received the words of Leviticus, he received it face to face in the midst of a holy fire that burned on top of Mount Sinai. So even when he talked about hairs coming out of a bobo, there was fire on those words, my friend, because they were received in relationship and not dead religion. And that's why some of us read the Bible and we get set on fire and other people go to sleep in the middle of a service like this. 
Oh, is that con condemnation or faith? <laughs> what did that preacher say to me? <laughs> now think about this. Every single thing that he says is fire. He said, my word is fire. He said, I don't care about those prophets that prophesy and they prophesy lies. Let them prophesy because, my, because it's like chaff to the wheat. My word is a fire and a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Come on. So you know when God's speaking to you, when that word comes on you like a fire, and you're like, my God, I don't understand it, but my heart's burning to follow this, this God, to know this supernatural God that cares so much about me that he would reach right into a little stinky Port Arthur refinery town and speak to me in the middle of a cow pasture. <laughs> Come on. God's word, the Bible said in... Uh, Jeremiah 23, 29. <laughs> My word is a fire. The Bible said Hebrews 12, 29. God is a consuming fire. What is He? Part of the time He's a fire and part of the time He's just sitting on the couch? No. God is a consuming fire. He is contagious. He sets everything on fire. It's contagious love. He will set the world on fire with a passion for the love of God. Listen, He is a fire. We, listen, we're the, we're, we're the clay. He's the potter. We're the creation. He's the glory. I'm telling you. And He's made us, of, he's made us as containers of the excellence of the power of His glory. And when you really come into contact with that kind of God, I don't care what your sin problem is. When you say, my God, I'm trading my addiction for something a little bit higher. I'm still an addict, but I'm Jesus addicted through and through. He's all up in my blood. He moves around on the inside of me. He shakes me from the, from the foundation of the core of my being. When he speaks, I tremble. I melt like wax. I feel his fire in his words. <laughs> How many want to know God like that? We've got to discern between soulish and spiritual connections. Soulish and spiritual. You say, what is that? Well, but see, the Word of God is a double-edged sword, and it pierces and divides between soul and spirit. Many people don't know the difference between their soul and their spirit. I'm going to give you one, one word on this. You ready? How can you know the difference? Because a soulish Christian isn't hungry for the Word. <laughs> a soulish Christian isn't hungry for the Word. I said a soulish Christian is not hungry for the Word, but a spiritual Christian is very hungry for the Word. You say, how can you prove that? Because I already said it. Hebrews 4.12, it says that my Word is sharper than any double-edged sword. It divides between soul and spirit. It's dividing. It's circumcising you. Well, that hurts. Yep. <laughs> You see, people that will only pray when it feels good are not allowing God to deal with their soulish realm. They're caught up into many sins and many problems because they only obey God when it feels good. How did it feel when Jesus was nailed to the cross for you? Are you feeling this? So here we go. Are you hungry? Are you hungry for the Word? Ask yourself, am I hungry for the Word? Am I hungry for the Word? You, oh, I don't believe that, Pastor. I think I'm just fine, and I'm not really hungry for the Word, but I just love me some Jesus. Well, Jesus is the Word, <laughs> right? And let me ask you this. Have you ever seen a baby that was healthy that wasn't hungry? You know what happens when a baby isn't hungry, right? They die. Hello? When a baby isn't hungry, it dies. Let me ask you this. Where do, you, do you consider yourself to be a spiritual person and not have hunger for the Word? Maybe you have a wrong consideration. <laughs> do you know when a person thinks they're more spiritual than they actually are, it blinds them? Isn't that a beast? And so I check myself. I say, am I hungry for the Word? Am I hungry? Did you know that you can get so hungry for the Word? You can get so hungry for the Word because His Word is a fire. See, God speaks by faith. And when a person hears by faith, they're set on fire immediately. <laughs> Did you hear that? God speaks, see, God speaks by faith. How, you ready for this? We're sort of, now this is, now we're getting into the nitty gritty. You ready for this? Whenever you're learning a new language, the Lord began to speak to me about this. I speak in Spanish. I speak a lot of Swahili. Let me, let me show you this. When you're learning, how many people speak more than one language as far as you speak more than English? You speak it fluently? <laughs> you, you? Okay, now here's the deal. Whenever you're learning a new language, you've got to know 
You got to know, you got to understand the language, right? And you got to know what language is spoken. Are you ready for this? And you got to know how that language is spoken. Did I lose anybody? So, what is the language of God? Faith. Say it with me, faith. faith. Now, let me, I don't have a lot of time on this. We're going to talk about it again Sunday. So, if you don't understand that God doesn't speak like you and me, <laughs> you and I, God speaks by faith. In fact, he calls those things that are not as though they were. God doesn't speak like us. He'll say, Carrie, you're going to have a baby. And she's like, well, the doctor said I can't have a baby. So now either she believes or she can't hear. Are you seeing this? So it's hard to hear God say what you think you already know. Why? Because God speaks a certain way. How does he speak? He speaks by faith. And if you don't listen by faith, then you're not going to realize that God's telling you to do something impossible. He might be saying, leave that old boyfriend behind. Uh-oh. We don't like that. Well, that's impossible. We're, we're you know, we, you know, we... We're, we think, you know, we, we run together. You know, I've been knowing him since, you know, but you know what? God speaks by faith, and you can't hear unless you hear by faith. Unless you realize that God's calling you to an impossible life, you will not listen to God. You'll read the Bible and say, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, brother. But then the one that wrote the scripture sitting next to you, whispering to you, and you're saying, I, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> right? You, when we stand in front of the congregation with a mic, you may not realize this, and we say, God is healing. Well, either I'm an idiot and he doesn't do anything or I heard him. Are you feeling this? That's why you don't see that done <laughs> a lot of times. Because you know what? That takes faith to hear God speak. Because God speaks by faith. Even when he spoke the original scripture, he spoke it by faith. And somebody had to believe and write it down. And that's why the guy that wrote the scripture was full of power. And he overcame in every possible way. And that's why somebody might pick up a, a Bible and begin to read it and it quoting it and be in total failure. Because they're not developing a relationship to hear the one that speaks those scriptures. You following this? Is this good? So, how, so what is the language of God? Faith. You seen this? How, how is the language of God spoken? Through love. The way, the way, his accent is love. The, the, you know how he speaks faith? By love. The way that he speaks faith. Think about, write this down. The way that he speaks, see, <laughs> what is his language? Faith. How does he speak faith to you in love? You see, if you don't realize that it's love, then God will ask you to do something impossible and you will never do it because you feel like he's condemning you. I know I just dug into something right there. Think about this. When, there, when Doubt is the platform for condemnation. See that? But faith is the platform for transformation and repentance. So as a pastor, I can be really careful and only say nice things that people want to hear and never speak by faith and never challenge somebody. And you know what? There's no repentance. And then when I say something that challenges them, you know, once in a blue moon, then they're like, oh, you're condemning me. You called out my sin. Well, you didn't believe that when I spoke that, that you should obey God? <laughs> right? So, well, why would... See, right, well, let, me, let me back up the tape. Let me show you this. Because when, a per, when God says, I'm going to deal with you about a certain area, and you're like, oh, you're condemning me, you're condemning me. Is anybody listening to this? Why would you feel condemned? Because you don't believe that you can obey Him because you've decided that you cannot. Because you don't realize that God speaks by faith. And the only way to hear is to hear by faith. Hebrews 11.3. By faith. <laughs> what does Hebrews 11.3 say? By faith we understand that the worlds were framed. Katartizo in the Greek. The worlds were framed by the what? The word of who? So how does he speak? <laughs> by faith. You see in this? So the way that he operates is by faith. He's like, I don't operate like you, but I want to show you how to operate like me. To hear by faith and to speak by faith and change the creation. Or you can just walk around in your dead religion like a little sheep, bah, bah, and never change anything because there's not any faith involved in that. And a baby Christian cannot make disciples because a baby will only multiply what they are. 
So you have to come into the place where you say, I'm hungry for the word. I'm hungry for the word. I'm hungry for the word. I'm going to grow up. I'm going to mature as I partake of the word. And as I mature, I know because I bear fruit of disciples and I bear fruit of signs and wonders and I bear fruit of the kingdom of God and I bear fruit of impossibilities being made possible and I bear fruit because when I tell the mountain to remove itself and throw itself in the sea, boom, it moves, <laughs> right? It's funny how people will argue with a pa- don't I? people will argue with a pastor or a minister that's been you know believing God for ten thousand dollars or believing God for these fifteen people to not fall off the wagon and they don't even know what it's like to believe God for uh, to, to get a job promotion and they don't even understand that realm of faith <laughs> and they'll argue with a pastor to death about something in the church or about something ridiculous and it's like man you don't understand there's like a whole different realm <laughs> so I, I've learned if I get around especially an older pastor I'm just kind of like okay you know this guy I mean that, this guy's gone through some stuff you know he's believed for some stuff you know I mean, you may not understand, but that changes you. When you begin to believe and you begin to take care of other people and you begin to eat the word for year after year and you believe the word and you consume the word, not just shaka bande all the time, you know. No, not just when it feels good. We're talking about when you're crucified for that word. <laughs> so God wants to raise up a company of people that are made strong eating the word. Deuteronomy 8.3 let's read this and and we're running out of time but you see what happens god speaks to you what kind of language faith but how is it coming to you by love you see if you take a word of god which is faith and you take it have you ever had this happen and somebody beats you over the head with a scripture you know what i'm talking about and you're and and it's like the bible says you know you're a messed up sinner you know or whatever you're going to hell or whatever and you know what i'm talking about an angry religious person you know what i'm saying and they bring the word to you and you're like dude you're beating me down with the word man because they didn't know that number one it was faith and it had to be spoken by love the bible said in ephesians 2 speaking the word in love we would grow up into the head of christ you see that now look at this deuteronomy 8 3 He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. Everybody say hunger. And fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread alone. Say it with me. Man doesn't live by bread alone. You ready? But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You know how God was going to get somebody out of the desert? By his word. Here you go. You ready for this? When, whenever, whenever they were in bondage and they were slaves in Egypt, it was a form of old life patterns, old sinful patterns But before we knew Jesus. And we came to a church tripping out. Look at all these crazy people. Before we ever made the decision to accept Jesus. Come on. How many want to be real? And you were sitting there in bondage, not knowing if you wanted to agree that there was a better life. You're like Morpheus. I know. You're like Neo in the Matrix talking about, I don't know if I want to eat that pill or not. I don't know if I want to know what's really going on or not. And you're sitting there thinking, I don't know if I want to live by faith or not. But guess what? See, there you are sitting over there in Egypt. And then Moses shows up. Let my people go. And he preached a faith message. And he brought signs and wonders. And salvation began right there in oh, dirty old Egypt, man. And he led 2.5 million people right out of the, come on, right out of Egypt. One man army. His name was Moses. You didn't mess with this man. He walked into the most powerful nation and it was a manifestation of deliverance. It was equivalent to your salvation. But then they had to go through the Red Sea, baptism. Then they had to go through a desert which only took 13 days, but it took them 40 years. They went around and around and around. You ever seen a dog chase its tail? They went around and around and around. They had all kind of good doctrine, but their problem was they were complainers and they were unthankful and they spoke against the man of God. And you know what they did? They they refused to live by faith. Because God said you will enter the promise, but they had to hear it by faith. Instead, they didn't hear by faith and they stayed in the desert. So God said, you know what? You're going to die unless I give you fresh bread every day. So he said, I'm going to give you my word. My word is bread. Jesus was the bread of life. Jesus was the word of God. He said, you might be going through a trial right now with your addiction or with something from your past and nobody knows. But God said, as long as you will open your ear and hear my word and receive the living bread, you will come alive and I will 
will sustain you. My bread will give you life, number one. And number two, my bread will sustain you in any storm. Just receive my word. Receive my bread. How many say, I want to be hungry for his word? Come on. And the scripture started off, and it said he humbled them. Everybody say humbled. You know what the desert does? It humbles you. When you fall flat on your face and make a fool of yourself, or some people's sins nobody knows about, and you're like, oh my God, I'm an idiot, I'm a fool. And God says, you know what? Now you know that you must obey me in every form of the word. You must receive my word and the strength therein and be hungry for my word. And I will, number one, the word will save you. And number two, the word will sustain you. Come on, how many want to be sustained? The only way that you will be sustained is if you are hungry for the word. I do not care if you have a ministry where you fill stadiums. If you are not hungry for the word, my friend, that you'll be just like some other dude that fell off in some sin and even made even more of the fool for it. Are you following this? You, do you realize how many people are not really strong in the word and they fall and they fall again because they didn't know that they were sick as a baby and they should have been hungry? So you got to know, i got to be hungry. If I am an infant, if I am a baby, I must be hungry. If I am an adult, I have to be hungry or I'm not healthy. If I'm, I, I have the fear of God to climb all over me, Kay, if I'm not hungry for the word, I'm telling you. Oh, you're condemning me. Yeah, because see, so, but you got to, how many follow what I'm saying? How many say, man, I better develop a hunger for the word. That's just real old school. I mean, the Baptist church down the road to tell you that. I mean, come on, man. I mean, people know this. We know this to be true. I mean, we got to be hungry for the word. How many want to, how many want to develop a hunger for the word? And see, when you develop a hunger for the Word, I don't care if you're reading Leviticus or what you're reading. His Word's like a fire because you begin to learn by faith. Come on. And His Word, see, and, and last of all, I'm going to say this. I'm kind of running out of time. But the, uh, whenever you're speaking a new language, it's a language of faith. It's spoken by love. You ready for this? And, and what, the Lord was talking to me about this on the airplane. See, I was learning Spanish, but I'm, how many know that learning a language is a process? If I'm going to speak your language, you're from a different country than me. He's from heaven. <laughs> Now, he's speaking to me, watch this, but as I'm learning, how many know it's a process, right? <laughs> and, and you know what? When you're learning another language, there are certain words that it takes you longer to identify what the word means. <laughs> and you know what I found? That as you're learning another language, you, you, you're having a conversation with your buddy. You're like, hey, you know, and you think you understand everything. <laughs> and then six months later, you learn some more words. And then you're talking to him again. You're like, oh my God, I didn't realize what the, I didn't know what I was talking about. And you realize just one word that you did not understand can change your life. One word that you've been missing. Ask yourself, what word am I missing? What is the thing that I'm missing? Because the word is the answer for your dilemma. You see this? God gave you 66 books. Which one of those books are you unfamiliar with? Which one of those books do you not know? Do you, do you, can you sit here and tell me something that Zephaniah says? Think about it. How well do you think you really know God? Have you ever heard him speak through Habakkuk? Have you ever heard God speak through Amos? <laughs> know what I'm saying? Right? So how badly do you want to hear, my God, if he's, he's so important to me that if he said something, I want to find out what it is. Come on. See, God's calling me right now to rise up a revolutionary people that will be hungry for his word and still know his power and move in the miracles but still know his word. The enemy is not going to come knocking on your door and deceive you into some compromise because you know the word. See, somebody can't come to me and get me to compromise and stop moving into miracles because I know the word. You're not going to deceive me and cause me to miss my promised land because I know the word. And when you have a love for the truth, you cannot be deceived. So my question to you is, are, do you, are you in love with the word? I mean, ask yourself, how hungry am I for the word? Let's go ahead and stand up. I'm going to release uh, four more things to you. Do you guys remember? Well, I'm going to say that on Sunday. Let me, get, let me give you four things real fast. Number one, God is a father. Say with me, God is a father. So when he speaks to you, he speaks as a father. He doesn't just speak as some mysterious, uh, invisible person floating around the Milky Way. He speaks to you by love. He says, you're my daughter. And he said, I'm going to speak to you as a father. So you've got to know that you are somebody important. You've got to know that. Because if you think that he's, that he's just big and mighty God and you're just a little flea, he's going to step on you if you sneeze wrong, that you don't realize. You see, you don't beg God. You are a child of God. 
How, do you recognize the language of God? Are you recognizing the language of God? Number two, faith is repentance, but doubt is the platform for condemnation. Number three, prayer needs vision. See, I told you, we're, here's a very powerful concept. If you can catch this to whatever degree, whenever you go into prayer, you need to have a vision. You need to pray with a vision. If you just go in prayer and you pray aimlessly, are you guys listening? If you have a vision, I know this, this might be difficult to understand. If you have a vision, when you pray, it will bring you into places with God. But if you have no vision when you pray, then you're praying in circles. Let me give you an, an example. When you go and you shut your door, I had a guy today ask me for something help, some kind of help, and I said, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you who can help you. I want you to go across the street. I want you to go in your office, and I said, I want you to shut your door and cry out until God responds to you and pours his glory out in your office. And the guy looked at me like I was crazy. Because you don't think that God will answer you. But I can't help you. Are y'all following this? But how many are willing to go to God and get the answer? How many are willing? Not everybody's willing. Somebody will say, oh, help me. Oh, help me. And they're cursed because they're always leaning on the flesh. But the man or woman that says, I'm going to go to God and I'm going to close my door and I'm going to cry out until my God hears me or either he's real or he's not. Either he answers me or he doesn't, but I'm going to find out. Yeah.